There are a lot of people out here. Um, uh, fans of Matilda, I think. Uh, yeah, probably. Any fans of Matilda? Yeah. 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 My, my mom's a, a graduate school professor. She uh, she teaches uh, teachers to get certified and so on, and she specifically tells them watch Matilda and look at Miss Honey as an, as an oh. example of, uh, of of how to be a good teacher. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. You know, it's funny at every show that I do, I've found, or every con that I do. Uh, if I do any kind of speaking event, and actually, why don't we go ahead and do this now? Anybody here a teacher or a librarian? Raise your hand. Yep, always, always. They're always teachers and librarians. Uh, I, it's really funny, That's there's a really big uh, Matilda cult following of teachers and librarians, which is like one of my favorite things. It's a great people, great people to have uh, as a cult following. One of the things that, uh, that I like opening with is, you know, what people were fans of when they were kids. You were a fan of Matilda before you were. Matilda. Yeah, I was. I loved the book. It was something that my brothers and I had read. They had read it in school, and in fact, when I was very, very young, I was, you know, maybe three or four, uh, I was always sick a lot. I'd always get the stomach blue or whatever, cold, and my mother mother took me one day to my brother's school because she couldn't find a babysitter and I was curled up in the back in a blanket while she read Matilda out loud to the class because she was a really good actress and she could play all the characters and do all the voices so they would ask her if she would come in to read it and I remember just being transfixed just fascinated and loving this book and this character and feeling amazed that there was this young girl character not much older than me who was so empowered and empowering so I just completely fell in love with it I would quote the lines to my brothers and then a few years later, after I'd been in a movie or two, my agent called up and said, uh, hey, we have so many scripts coming in for Mara. We have this one, we have this one, we have Matilda, we have this other one. My mom went, whoa, 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 back up, back up. Did you say Matilda? Yes, yeah, send us that one. And uh, I went in and I auditioned and Danny DeVito and I got along right away. And yeah, the rest is history, I guess. <laughs> Now, there's a, there, there are a number of fandoms that you're a part of, and we, yeah. uh, we, share, we share a particular favorite author, comic book writer, a uh, fellow by the name of Neil Gaiman. Oh, yeah, wonderful. He's, he's great. I, yeah, I've always loved his stuff. What, uh, what, what, is, what is this guy like? You've, you've run into him. I have. You know, Good Omens was like, was like a really big thing for me growing up. Uh, Good Omens was one of my favorite books, and I actually, my college boyfriend and I would give each other Neil Gaiman books as gifts. And like, instead of birthday cards, we would get like a rare Neil Gaiman book <laughs> and write like happy birthday in it. And uh, that, was, that was a tradition for us. And uh, we, he, he was somebody like, I remember he loaned me American Gods, I think a week into us dating. Maybe don't give that to somebody you've been dating for a week. There are some interesting scenes in it that are a little disturbing that he had completely <laughs> forgotten about. Uh, very risque, very weird stuff. But, I mean, I loved it anyway, and we ended up dating for three years after that, so, you know. Uh, but I, I uh, so I'd always loved the books, and, uh, and I remember uh, a few years later, I was, like, on Twitter, and I'd, like, met some people through there, and then somebody said, like, do you want to come to this event tonight? And uh, I, I was like, yeah, sure, and I went there at the last minute, and who should be there but Neil Gaiman. And so I went up to him, and... Uh, I was like, uh, you know, hi, I'm Mara, and he's like, oh yes, how are you? I love your Twitter, and which was amazing, and I and I gushed all over him, and I was just like, and he was covered in glitter at the time, which I think was probably Amanda Palmer's fault, uh, and I was like, I was like. Uh, you know, I just, I love your book so much, and my boyfriend and I used to give the to each other as gifts, and I loved him, and he was just like, oh, that makes me so happy to hear, and I wanted to ask him if I could give him a hug, and then he said, give me a hug. <laughs> And I was like, yes, and I gave him a hug, and I went home, and I was just like, and I felt like so incredible, and then I, I looked at like what day it was, and it was actually my ex's and I's my anniversary, I think. So, so it was kind of fantastic that, you know, I, I moved on from him, and I moved on to like, you know, meeting Neil Gaiman at parties and stuff, so, you know. No, no more second-hand Gaiman. Exactly, exactly, source. exactly. So, yeah, he was a really great guy. He's been really sweet, and, uh, and uh, yeah, he's he's great, and that's I still love all of his work. I have a couple more for you. We've got some people at the mic. Mm -hmm. If you do have a question, go ahead and line up. Uh, a lot of people in the room, like myself, probably big fans of Robin Williams. Yeah. 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 Woo! What what was it like working on set with him? I mean, you didn't, you didn't like go on vacation together. You didn't have this extensive you know personal relationship. No, I mean like he, but he was really just a wonderful guy. He really was. I mean, he was. Somebody was asking me earlier today if he ever, you know, 
did any like blue humor around the kids, anything inappropriate, but he never did. He very much had this separation between what was appropriate for adults and what was appropriate for children. And that is something that I very much appreciate because I think kids should be kids as long as they want to be and they shouldn't be forced to hear anything that might make them feel uncomfortable. Uh, so I really, I, I really respected that, I really loved that. He was kind, he was funny. He was very good when he had an audience. He was happiest when he had an audience, when he was telling a story, when he was performing, when he was, and children are often the best audience, so you know, he'd make hand puppets that said things like, I don't like you, you smell like poop. And you know, which is the height of hilarity when you're five. Uh, and, and he'd make his, you know, he'd make his little bag, uh, like bark under the table. And he'd uh, tell all kinds of jokes. I remember one of the first times I met him, I, he asked me what kind of music I liked. And then, as now, my favorite is musical theater. So <laughs> uh, he said, he started singing There Is Nothing Like a Dame from South Pacific while he was a man dressed as a woman singing about how there is nothing like a dame. It was, it was kind of an interesting, you know, uh, situation there. It's great that his immediate go-to is Rodgers and Hammerstein. Yeah, I think he has. I think I must. I must have started listing musicals, and that's and he's just immediately burst into there was nothing like a dame, which my mom thought was amazing. Uh, it was and and yeah, he he was very quiet one on one. He he was kind of shy with adults, very soft spoken, uh, very gentle guy. But yeah, working with him was great. You know, he always he did crack jokes, but he was also kind and respectful as well. Now, uh, one of the things that introduced me to your marvelous Twitter feed mm -hmm. is Welcome to Night Vale. Yeah, any Welcome to Night Vale fans? Yeah. Yeah, yeah a few of you, yeah. How did, how did this happen? How did you get swept into this uh, sensational phenomenon that it's become? Well, it was kind of a weird coincidence because I started looking up Welcome to Night Vale uh, online, I started seeing them on Twitter, and I thought that they were very funny in a very dark way. And then I started actually listening to the show, and I thought, oh wow, this show is great. And then I found out that they worked with the New York Neo-Futurists, which is a theater group that I love, and I knew people who worked with them. I had done shows with people who were working uh, with them, and I'd gone to college with people who worked with the neo-futurists, so I had the neos in common with them, and because of that, I, I had this connection there, <laughs> and I told them, I said, look, you know, I really love what you do, I love the neos, I, if you want to do anything ever, I love doing voiceover work, I, you know, I don't do much film or screen acting anymore, but I, I love doing voiceover so much, and I would love to do more of it. And, uh, and they were like, sure, we could give you a part. And I was like, like who, like the mayor? And they said, well, we were thinking the faceless old woman who secretly lives in your home. And I said, even better. <laughs> so, and I mean, I think Desiree Birch plays, plays the mayor now and she's just fantastic. So uh, she's, she's wonderful. She was also a neo-futurist. Uh, and yeah, and then, and then I got into it right as it, the popularity was exploding. I mean, I remember we did a show at a, a bookstore in San Francisco and Cecil walked out afterwards and was just swarmed. It was like Beatlemania. I, All four of the Beatles in one body. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, with that voice. And just like teenage girls, like swarming him. And like, he was just like, he had not, was not expecting that. Uh, and yeah, it exploded. And I got to tour with them in the US and Canada and had a wonderful time. And the faceless old woman is one of my favorite characters to play, uh, I think. And people sometimes ask me, they're like, are you like a lot of your characters? And I'll be like, yeah, I mean, I like to read like Matilda and all that, but I'm also a little bit like the faceless old woman because I'm really nosy. <laughs> and we'll get to your questions. Uh, I have read a book. Anybody else read this book called Where Am I Now? Mara's book? Yeah, a couple of you. Everybody in this room should have read this book. <laughs> Everybody should read this book. I've read the rest of you, come on, guys. Rest of come you, on. Rest of you, new customers. Yeah. So uh, what, what motivated you to, to, to put all of these thoughts and all of these uh, memoir-type feelings uh, into, into book form? Well, I always wanted to be a writer. I mean, even on sets, I was always making up stories yeah, and writing writes, them. Mara Writes Stuff. Mara Writes Stuff was a, yeah, was, was a, my, my Twitter handle, and Mara Wilson Writes Stuff was my website for a long time, still is, actually. But... Uh, I always wanted to be a writer. I knew I wanted to be a writer. I wasn't sure I always wanted to act for the rest of my life, but uh, I always knew I wanted to be a writer. So it was my desire to write a book, I think, and for a while I was thinking maybe I'll do a YA, maybe I'll do a graphic novel, maybe I'll do something else, but there seemed to be more interest. And I'd been doing live storytelling and writing articles about my life for different websites and places, so there was uh, some interest in that, especially when I started writing about child stars for places, for places like Cracked. And they started asking me, uh, people started asking me what I thought about writing a memoir, 
And I was like, oh, I guess that could be, you know, the first thing that I wrote. And also, I mean, I think that I did kind of want to reclaim my narrative in a way, because I do think that when you are in the public eye for a while, and then you disappear, people like to make up stories about what happened to you. So I wanted to say like, mm, no, it wasn't exactly the way that you thought it was, or maybe it was in some ways, but it wasn't in others. And so I wanted to kind of explain my relationship with Hollywood, which uh, I describe as a mutual breakup. And I wanted also, I think, to honor a lot of the wonderful people that I worked with, like Danny DeVito, like uh, Rhea Perlman, like Robin Williams, and also read about my mother, who passed away when I was eight, shortly after we finished filming Matilda. Uh, I, you know, she was such a force in my life and such a character that I wanted to pay tribute to her as well. Uh, and yeah, I think it was also, I just also knew that it would be fun. And uh, I've always loved to tell stories to anyone who will listen. Uh, so that was something that I'd always wanted to do. Well, very sincerely, it's, it is a book full of nothing but good chapters. And I Thank think you. my favorite really is one that she writes as a letter to Matilda. Um, yeah, it was, it's, a, it's, that was probably one of the hardest ones to write, actually. I'm just talking about it. Yeah, it was, it was very, it was very emotional and it was very difficult, but it was also very cathartic. Cathartic, I think, and very. It, it was it was hard for me. This is this character who, in some ways, I feel like almost is like my big sister. She's like somebody that I've I love and adore, but in some ways have lived in the shadow of for a long time. And I've been able to, I think, reconnect with her in a way in the past few years because, like, even in college, I you know I would clam up when people asked me about Matilda because. I felt like they liked her more than they liked me. <laughs> and that was hard. But now I, I mean I'm just I'm just incredibly thrilled that I got to pay tribute to this amazing character. Hi there. So you on your Twitter you're very, you know, opinion you're very like women's rights and things like that and gender equality in Hollywood specifically. Mm -hmm. With what's going on right now, do you feel like that there's going to be this enough this inevitable shift with more people speaking up or do you think that it's just going to continue to kind of be swept under the rug and not talked about and continue to be a problem? I mean, I definitely think that it's a good thing right now. I mean, it's terrible that these things happen, but I do think that it is good that a lot of these, you know, accusations and these cases and such are being brought to light because I think that's the first step towards justice. And I think that that is very important. Hopefully, hopefully it will lead to something more. I don't know if Hollywood is inherently corrupt, but I do think that there are there are power imbalances there that can lead to these really messed up circumstances where people can get taken advantage of very easily, uh, especially with a lot of older men and younger women and also younger men, although it, this happens across genders. Uh, so I do think that that's something, I, I always say that Hollywood isn't immoral, but it is amoral, and that can leave the door open for some things that are not so great to happen. People can get taken advantage of. Uh, I do hope that this is something, I do think that for a very long time that people just kind of thought, oh, this is the way that it is. And just because something is the way that it is doesn't mean it's the way that it has to be. So I'm actually, I'm, I'm a bit hopeful now. I'm sorry to hear, of course, about all the horrible things that have happened, but I am hopeful that maybe this can change. Well, if I can, as a, as a little bit of a follow-up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the power in that is the, the culture of silence wrapped around. Yeah, it's definitely the culture of silence and definitely the, the you know, being too afraid. And it's, it's the power imbalances. This man has so much more power than you. This woman has so much more power than you. Who will believe you. Know, you. Who will believe you. And, and also the sort of expectation of, you know, you are your looks, you are your body, and we, we own you, which is, which is horrible. It's, you know, objectification. And so that, I think, is something you know, that uh, there's there's a lot of, even not not with like horrible behavior, but just things that you don't like. You have to bite your tongue a lot in Hollywood, which is another reason why I'm not a big Hollywood star, because I'm not good at that. So, <laughs> so yeah, and but I, I do think that there's there's just like this weird complicit silence, there's this weird open secret, and, and uh, you, the, the world, you know, the world is small, and there's more information out there, and there's more stuff out there now, and if you do bad things, if, or if you act like a bad person, people are going to know about it. And I think that's funny, because I do think in a way that that has affected the way that I've lived my life, because I've always lived my life under the assumption that anything bad I did could be exposed to the public at any time. I mean, I'm not the most famous person in the world, so probably not as many people would care, but it's something... I, that's held me accountable. It's the reason that I haven't done anything. It's one. It's one of many reasons that I haven't done anything, you know, terribly immoral or illegal. I also don't really want to because I'm, you know, a goody two shoes. But it's 
it's, uh, it's definitely kept me, I think, from, from doing these things. And I do think that that responsibility is something that everybody, you know, has to realize now. It's harder to be a bad person in this world in some ways. I mean, obviously there's still horrible people in power doing horrible things, but, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, best case scenario that we are getting more accountability as we go on. Thank you. Hi. Uh, first of all, I'm so happy to see a positive role model and a goody two-shoes. And on that note, uh, you did a movie, A Simple Wish, with Martin Short, which has not been mentioned yet today, which is kind of a surprise because he's rather well known himself. Did you um, have any sort of fairy godparent uh, who was looking out over you in, uh, during filming? Yeah, you know, I, I would say I, I did have a lot of people taking care of me, especially during that time, which was hard because I filmed that right after my mother died. Michael Ritchie, who was the director on that, and his family were incredibly kind to me. They were wonderful people. They took care of me, and uh, they were they were really great. Danny DeVito and Rhea Perlman were like that as well. I also had an agent that I loved and trusted. She was a wonderful woman. I had a lot of, I, I was really lucky. I mean, not everybody I worked with was wonderful, but most of them were. And I feel very, very grateful to have had people like Danny and Rhea and Michael Ritchie and all of these people in my life. Did you enjoy yourself being on your childhood movie productions of Mrs. Dalfire and Matilda? Did I enjoy myself? Yes. Yeah, I did. I had a lot of fun with them. I mean, sometimes it was hard work and sometimes it was long days. But, I mean, I, I do think that I had these positive experiences. And I think that I had a great time. I mean, Matilda at times felt like summer camp. And yeah, there were days when I was really tired and really exhausted. And when I see those movies now, I can look back on them and think, oh, right, that was the day we did 27 takes in a row. Or that was the day that I was getting over the flu. Like all the used car salesmen, uh, all the used car sales stuff at the beginning of Matilda, I was just getting over the flu. And I look and sound exhausted. Exhausted. I had to do ADR for all my lines afterwards because my voice was gone. But uh, but overall, yeah, I did have a positive experience, I would say. Thank you. First of all, Ms. Wilson, uh, thank you for being here today. Um, my question is, uh, looking back at uh, Matilda now, Matilda now, uh, do you have any scenes that you would believe are your favorite? Do I have any scenes? Favorite scenes from Favorite, Matilda. Favorite scenes from Matilda. To film or to watch? Both. Uh, to film, I would say the montage at the end with, with Matilda, that was really fun. The, with Miss Honey and Matilda, those scenes were really fun, except for the time that uh, I think we were, and Beth, who played Miss Honey and I, we were eating chocolates, and Danny said, feed each other. And I remember like looking wistfully at the caramel that I had gotten and going over like this to her, and she had gotten this cherry cordial one, and I bit into it and cherry juice went all down the front of my wardrobe. Uh, I had to get cleaned up after that, it was pretty funny. Uh, the scene where we throw stuff at, at uh, Pam Ferris, at Miss Trunchbull, as she's going out, oh my gosh, that was so much fun. It was just, it was anarchy, it was fantastic. It was what every kid wants to do. So that really is something that I think is great. and. Uh, I do think that I, I really like a lot of the scenes with uh, with Miss Trunchbull just because Pam Ferris was such a wonderful actress and because it's such a contrast to her actual personality where she is one of the kindest people I've ever met in my life. She's gentle, she's patient, she's loving, and she would love to show you pictures of her rescue dogs. Aww. Hi, Mara. Uh, first Hi. off, thanks for being here. Uh, second, uh, as I was reading your book, I found a lot of it so relatable. Maybe the Big, the most relatable thing for me was that you planned your funeral before you ever planned your wedding. <laughs> so I yeah, was, I was a morbid kid. <laughs> Same. Uh, so I was just kind of wondering what songs had you picked out for your funeral as a child? <laughs> what do you have in mind now? Because I could use some suggestions. This you is know, the best question that is, of the weekend. Yeah, that is that is a fantastic. I, you know, I have an entire playlist of uh, of like my favorite songs ever. That I've been that I've been making, and I've been thinking like, which ones would I play? But like, it's really, it's really. Um, I don't think that a lot of them are especially appropriate for a funeral, <laughs> because there are things like uh, "Little Red Corvette" by Prince, <laughs> or a certain really infamous song uh, by the Divinals that was banned in Australia, mm. and yeah, was in the movie it's Austin Powers. The three-word title. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's there's stuff like that. There's. Um, 
Probably a lot of musical theater will be played at my funeral. Uh, not Les Mis or Phantom or anything like that, but maybe, you know, something, something uh, nice. I've actually had to make like a separate list for favorite show tunes and favorite musicals. So yeah, I mean, maybe a lot of Janelle Monet and a lot of like, what else is it? Uh, Brit Pop and Motown. Those are like my favorite, my favorite kind of music ever. So yeah, probably a lot of that. Some mountain goats too. Also, oh, also a lot of they might be giants. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Mara. Hi. Uh, just first, I'd like to say thank you for coming here. Thank you. And my question is, um, the first time I saw you, like, now, was at the very end of the Nostalgia Critics review of A Simple Wish. Mm -hmm. I gotta ask, uh, how fun was it doing that scene at the end? That was really fun, and Doug is a really, really nice, wonderful guy, and we still tease each other about stuff all the time. We've kept in touch. Uh, he's a really good guy with a really good sense of humor about himself and his work, so uh, he's been definitely really fun to work with. That's good. And also, don't mess with Mara Wilson. <laughs> it's a little ruder than that in, in the video, I believe, but yes. What do you think of the Tim Minchin Matilda musical? You haven't uh, seen it. I've, you know, I've seen the, the Matilda musical, and I, I really like it. It's, people ask me a lot, like, are you, have you seen it? Do you like it? And I do. Uh, people have asked me, like, don't you think you could play Miss Honey in it? And I'm like, no, I don't have that vocal range. Uh, I also, I also, yeah, those aren't the types of parts that I play. Also, stunt casting always kind of bothers me in musicals. I feel like it kind of takes me out of it in a musical. But, uh, but yeah, I've seen it. It's great, and the music in it is great. Uh, I really like the songs. I have, uh, I have a bunch them on my phone. Uh, I've talked with Tim Minchin online and he's a really nice guy and uh, I met one of the actresses who played Matilda a few years ago. We were at an event and she and her mom were getting ready and uh, I went up to her and I said hi I'm Mara and her mom blurted out oh we know who you are and we got pictures taken together and yeah she was she was adorable. So, uh, Sophia Janusa uh, yeah, I saw uh, Una Lawrence, who has now gone on to be like a great actress in a lot of different movies and shows. And uh, yeah, I'm very, I'm very proud of them. I think that they, they've all been doing really well. So yeah, I've seen it. It's great. Um, so you are one of my wife's like writing inspirations, and I was wondering who your favorite authors were and who your writing inspirations were. Oh, okay. Let's see. Um, I really love, I, I, I love plays. I really love reading plays. Plays are definitely something. I mean, I remember reading Angels in America when I was 16 and it just like blowing my mind. You know, I was like staying all, up all night reading Ibsen and uh, a, lot of, a lot of things like that. Um, I, I'm trying to think of who, I like a lot of nonfiction writers. Like I love Oliver Sacks, uh, people like that. Uh, I, of course I love Neil Gaiman as well. Um, I'm, I love Kim Stanley Robinson. I love, uh, who else do I love? I love Mary Gateskill, but do not read your stuff, her stuff unless you are willing to get a little disturbed and a little depressed. Uh, I also love, I love Thornton Wilder. I love, um, who else do I love? Carol Churchill. I love, uh, yeah, there's a lot. Uh, there's, there's definitely a lot. I also like, I also take a lot of, have a lot of respect for people like, uh, People who wrote very simply, people like Mark Twain, people like that. I also have a lot of respect for Judy Bloom. I think Judy Bloom is the coolest, and uh, I admire her so much. So yeah, there's there's definitely there's a lot of that, and uh, and yeah, that's just off the top of my head. I probably have more, but uh, those are those are some. Coming soon, Mara gives you a reading list. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I very well could. I would subscribe to that newsletter too. I, I very well could. So yeah, those are just some names off the top of my head. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, I was actually wanting to ask a clarification. I appreciate all the things you uh, say and do for the uh, LGBTQ community, and I wanted to ask what you meant by a, like boring by representation. Just as like I didn't understand your. What I mean is that I don't think, I think that sometimes LGBTQ representation, especially with bisexual and queer uh, identified people in movies and television, it's often, they are often seen as salacious, they are seen as sexy, they are seen as, um, you know, very, it's seen as sort of exotic in a way. And I think that while that is great, you know, I, I, there's also a lot of like, 
portrayal of them as evil or greedy. And I think that that really isn't what it is. That personality is, you know, it's it's different. And uh, it's it's different. And my, my friend Gabby Dunn sometimes says, she says, um, she says, I'm bisexual and I'm evil, but I'm not evil because I'm bisexual, I'm just evil. Uh, she's actually said it a lot more concisely than I did. So when I say that I want more boring representations, I, it, is I want it to be incidental that somebody is, is, you know, LGBTQ. I want it to just be like, yeah, they have this and also they have, you know, black hair and they like baking. Which, you know, this is also pretty much me, although my hair's more like dark brown. Um, and that's really, that's really what I mean by boring, is that I mean that it doesn't always need to be this, uh, this like over the top, sexy, exciting thing. There needs to be, you know, showing that you can be, it's, it's great to have the cool heroes and you know, all the, the sexy people there, but you know, we're not all like that. Some of us live kind of boring lives. So uh, I would like to see that. Thank you. So you brought it up multiple times about your love of show tunes, so I just have to ask, what's your favorite musical? And then what is your favorite individual song? And are they this, are they from the same? Uh, it's like asking a parent with multiple kids. Right? Kids. Um, I love, I, let's see, I love Cabaret. Uh, I love Cabaret. I've seen Cabaret live twice. Uh, I love Company, the older I get. Um, I loved, growing up I was really into Rodgers and Hammerstein, but my favorite was My Fair Lady. Um, and I do a really good, yeah, somebody's really excited about that. Uh, I, sang, I sang Just You Wait from My Fair Lady at a show that I did a few years ago with my friend Jenny Jaffe called Send in the Clowns, where we had comedians sing their favorite show tunes. Uh, it was pretty great. And, uh, but the thing is, when I did Just You Wait, I had just gone through a breakup. <laughs> so I ended up sounding more like Mrs. Lovett singing Just You Wait. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was really fun. Um, I, I, one that I love to belt out that probably nobody wants to hear me belt out is Ladies Who Lunch. Uh, I, uh, of course I loved Hamilton, of course I loved, you know, so many different uh, ones. Hedwig and the Angry Inch is another one that really meant something for me that uh, really affected me deeply. I actually wrote a list uh, a few years ago called What a Straight Man's Favorite Musical Says About Him. <laughs> Uh, which which I stand by and uh, yeah that was that was something that was really fun for me um, that was published on McSweeney's I yeah I don't know if I can pick a favorite song from from any of them just because I have so many a lot of the ones are songs that I can actually sing songs that are in my range so you know you get a good belter a good alto tune uh, that one is probably it I also think that it changes all the time um, and I know as soon as I step off stage I'm gonna be like this musical and this musical and this musical and this musical, so uh, I'll try to limit it to these for now. Oh, actually, you know what? Probably one of my favorites. Yeah, one of my favorites Get her started is on is, uh, is yeah is um, I love Jerry Orbach's versions of uh, Billy Flynn's songs in Chicago. Probably all I care about is "Love," sung by Jerry Orbach, is one of my favorite things ever. I've listened to that song. It comes up on on iTunes. Oh, every day I would say. That's a, that's a good one too. Uh, I also like I'm, I've never been like that big into Disney movies, but the music is so great. I think we all owe Alan Menken our childhood. Uh, I was really sick for a few weeks, and I listened to nothing but the Goofy movie soundtrack. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, that's also that's also guilty pleasure right there. So we got one last one. I've got some uh, some some last little things before yeah. we close out too. Uh, thank you. Um, my family and I we watch Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street every Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, at that young age, had you seen the original? We like yours better. And uh, did you feel any pressure feeling those shoes? You know, I did, actually. I, I felt some pressure being in Miracle on 34th Street, and uh, I was nervous about it. And I, I did like being in it. Uh, I, I did have a good time being in it. Um, and I'd seen the original, and I loved Natalie Wood so much. And I think I was kind of nervous when I was working on it because I remember my mom saying like, uh, saying like, oh well yeah, we love Natalie Wood, but it was one of her first roles. I mean like, tell, telling me this to like calm me down. She was like, it wasn't even one of Natalie Wood's best parts. You'll be fine. And, uh, and 
And then I went to an interview and they were like, so have you seen the original? And I said, yeah, but my mom didn't think Natalie Wood did a very good job in it. <laughs> Which was, you know, what my mom had told me to make me feel better. And my mom was horrified because she loved Natalie Wood. And she had to beg them. She was like, please don't put that in. That makes me sound like a monster. Uh, Saint Natalie Wood. Uh, and so <laughs> we'd, uh, but, and, it did feel a little weird being in a remake of something. I did feel a bit of pressure in that, but I I did love being a part of it, and there was you know a wonderful cast. I met so many great people in that. So uh, so yeah. Although uh, one of the things people would always say to me is they'd be like, so so you really believe in Santa Claus, right? And I'd say, no, I'm Jewish. Uh, yeah. When my mom told me, you know, she's like, it's about a little girl who doesn't believe in Santa Claus. I said, oh, is she Jewish like us? Yeah, no, but I guess that, I mean, I believed in the Tooth Fairy. That was sort of my, like, collateral, like, you know, I believe in the Tooth Fairy. I know what it's like to believe in something, but, uh, yeah, but I'm glad that people are still watching it, you know, years later, and uh, Christmas movies, you know, if they're decent, they have amazing staying power, apparently. So, uh, that is, um, so I guess also, you know, just on a practical level, if you ever get the opportunity of being a Christmas movie, do it. Because <laughs> that will pay your bills. <laughs> And people will love to watch you at Christmas time. So, you know, you'll make people happy and it'll pay the bills and it's perfect. <laughs> so I've got one more question for you. You've been here uh -huh. all weekend. You, there are yeah. a few other guests at the show. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I know there's at least one in particular that you, you're oh, a big God. fan of. Yes. You know, I mean, did, I, you, did, you, did you get a chance to hang out with, you know, maybe some people that you're a big fan of yourself? Yes, I did. I met, I met Christian uh, in, uh, you know, this Hodor uh, in Calgary a few months ago. He was, he was really cool. Um, and I was really excited about that. I talked to uh, Madeline Pesch a little bit, but uh, I didn't have the nerve to tell her that I love Riverdale. Um, she was busy. She was busy, like you know, filming and stuff. But I was really, really excited to meet David Tennant. I was so excited. I I love him in everything he's ever done, and I told him that. And my my friends, I, I was like posting on Facebook, like just to a couple of friends, like David Tennant is here, and I'm in the same room with him, but I don't know what to say, and I'm feeling shy. And they were like, just go say hi to him. He's known for being a nice guy. And I was like, yeah, but I don't know. They're like, he probably knows who you are. I'm like, there's no way he knows who I am. He doesn't have Twitter. Um, and then, yeah, and today I finally worked up the nerve to sit at the table with him and talk to him and introduce myself. And I told him, you know, I love everything you've ever been in. And he was so nice about it. And he said, yeah, you know, your, your, you know, your movies are on rotation at our house a lot too. And so people were like, I posted on Facebook and I said, did you know who he was? And I was like, yes, he did. <laughs> so, so that felt very cool. That felt very cool. And he was incredibly nice. So yeah, I was, I was, I'm very glad that that happened. That was very, that was very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Because you brought something up. A fan of My Fair Lady. Uh, My Fair Lady, yeah. I have often walked on this stage before. <laughs> yeah, the pavement always stayed beneath my feet before. All, All at once, once am I several stories high. Knowing I'm on the stage where <laughs> you live. Let's hear it one more time for Marlon. <laughs>